Welcome to Ask the Professor. I'm your host, Ron Tully, Dean for the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences here at UF. Ask the Professor is the show where we get to know our UF professors a bit better, learn about their vocational passions, what they love to teach, their ongoing research, service, scholarship, and creative projects. And hopefully when we're finished, we'll have a better understanding of their field, their typical workday, and of course, who they are and what motivates them. Today, I'm honored to welcome my College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences colleague and good friend, Professor Val Escobedo. Val is currently Associate Professor of Art and Chair of the Department of Visual and Performing Arts at the University of Finley. Since she joined the faculty at University of Finley in the art program in 2007, Val has taught courses in painting, drawing, printmaking, and 2D design. Val received her BFA from Bowling Green State University and her MFA in painting from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Val grew up in Northwest Ohio and previously taught art at Finley High School before moving into higher ed at UF. Some of her recent exhibitions include Milestones, a celebration of BGSU School of Art alumni at the Dorothy Uber Bryan Gallery in Bowling Green, Ohio, and the Department of Art Faculty and Alumni Exhibition at Miami University Art Museum in Oxford, Ohio. She has also been selected for the 2010-2012 International Painting Annuals and the 2016 International Drawing Annual published by Manifest Press. She currently lives in Finley with her husband, Alceo. So Val, we've known each other for probably 10 plus years or so, but I don't think I've ever heard the story of why you chose to be an artist or do you feel you chose it? And then also why you decide to become a teacher. So first, thanks for having me. And yes, uh, this is a good question. I think with probably most people in the arts, we had some experiences when we were kids that uh, led us to become practitioners in the arts. So growing up, I just liked to make things. Uh, my mom was a home ec teacher and I learned how to sew and I did embroidery and I had 4-H projects where I was making things. And there was a little ceramic shop in my hometown and I'd go in there after school and paint my little ceramic figurines. So just as a kid growing up, I, I always enjoyed making things and the process of crafting things. So that's always been around. Um, and then as far as teaching goes, that one, I, I kind of joke about that. I came from or come from a family of teachers. Both my parents taught high school. And as a kid, I think I, just sort of swore off becoming a teacher. Uh, but in the end, I had to accept the fact that it's it's in my blood. Uh, multiple people in the family have become teachers or, or educators in some way. And, you know, by the time I graduated from high school, I was pretty certain that I wanted to become a teacher. So it's, yeah, I've just always had a passion about teaching. What were the subjects your parents taught and any other family members that were teachers? So my mom was a home ec teacher. My dad taught VOAG and industrial arts. Uh, my brother was a elementary school principal. And one of my sisters was uh, not a teacher, but she was a 4-H agent in New Jersey. So there's a lot of educational components to that. So, yeah. It definitely is in your blood then. And I can see specifically with the two disciplines that your parents taught, there's an obvious connection, you know, when you say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah, yeah. Nice. So I know there are plenty of stereotypes, tired, both positive and negative about artists, the starving artists, for example. Um, what are some careers people might not be aware of that students in art might consider? Gosh, that's always an interesting question. And sometimes it can be a tough question when students you know, incoming or prospective students come in and ask that question or their parents ask that question. Um, and the answer to it, well, there's different answers to that question. Uh, if students focus in on design areas, whether it's graphic design or interior design or product design, uh, those kind of areas have a really pretty clear um, career path. And there are definitely options out there for students who want to pursue art in more of a design sense. Uh, and then also students who do have uh, an interest in 
being an educator, there's certainly plenty of careers and jobs out there for art educators. So those are the, the clear career paths. Now there is some truth in if you're the idea of a starving artist. Now, now we're not necessarily starving, but if you're choosing a career, if you wanna be a, a painter or a potter uh, or a photographer, that career path isn't always uh, as clear cut as it is in other fields. And what it really comes down to is your own personal passion and how you go about making that happen for yourself. And if you're passionate enough about making art in whatever way that, you know, whatever area that is, you'll find a way to do it. And, uh, you know, some, some people will, will be able to do that as their, you know, full-time job or their primary income. We have students who graduate and have, you know, the day job, but they also keep up their art practice uh, along with it. And so there's different ways to kind of navigate that. And then, you know, there's just skills that you get when you're studying the arts that can be applied to a lot of different fields. I think it's important for students to know, like, you don't have to have the art job. There's things that you're gaining from this education that can be applied to a lot of different careers and you just have to know how to kind of package that and market that and, and know that about yourself. So thinking ahead, you know, with careers, we have this new center on campus for STEAM, right? The the A in STEAM, of course, is art. Do you, do you see that changing people's perceptions of art as a career? How do you see it influencing that? How do I see the incorporation of STEAM or the yeah, the concept of STEAM, it used to just be STEM. There was a lot of discussion of STEM, which of course is right. science, technology, engineering, and depending on who you talk to, math or medicine. And the A is in art now, and there seems to be a concerted effort by educators, and I would say our government, to, to really incorporate that in. How does that maybe alter, uh, help evolve people's perception about art as a career, and more importantly, as art as a necessity? Yeah, um, so I think the reason it probably has moved from STEM to STEAM is people's realization that, uh, I say this is such a big question. <laughs> There's skills that you acquire as an artist that you may not acquire in some of those other areas. And there are things that are very specific to being an artist. Um, there's a book that I use with my art education students in their methods class that's called Studio Thinking. And the whole book or a big function of the book is to argue for and outline all the things that you learn in the art classroom um, that don't necessarily have to do specifically with art. Um, so students in the arts, uh, they're learning, of course, creativity. I think that's a big reason that it's evolved from STEAM or STEM to STEAM. They learn how to envision things um, and see things that uh, create things that aren't there, I guess, <laughs> envision the possibilities that are out there. Um, students that are in the arts, they learn a lot about persistence and perseverance because I think being in any area of the arts, there's a lot, just a lot of failure that happens. Like that's just part of the process. I talk to my students a lot about the fact that, you know, if you get something right on the first try in art, you're kind of lucky. Like it, it's just not the way it works. Um, so Sounds like writing. <laughs> right. Yes. So Incorporating the arts means you're embracing that idea of persisting and persevering and continuing to like uh, problem solve something. And I think that's really important to all those other areas as well. Um, and gosh, so how to, I, I guess in the bigger picture, I, I really appreciate it that it's evolved from STEM to STEAM because it's acknowledging like all of these skills that the arts bring to the table that you may not necessarily be cultivating in 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 other areas i think that's well articulated uh, you know as dean uh, that oversees all the arts and humanities i think there's 
there is kind of an undercurrent, if you will, in, in culture, at least over you know, most of my lifetime, where art, um, and I would include creative writing certainly in that mix, is, is sometimes considered as superfluous or tangential to a, you know, a career path. And I think all the, the reasons you've articulated show you why it isn't. It's essential and it's embedded. Um, I just think about the, the health aspects as well. I mean, you mentioned certainly the invention and the, the ability to make a mistake to start from scratch, but also in that, the, the intense emotional experience you get for creating something that's your own, I think can't be underestimated in terms of kind of the psychological impact on your self-esteem and your well-being. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, one of the things I love about teaching visual arts is um, I like seeing students learn who they are as people through the art making process. Like that's probably one of my favorite things to observe or be a part of, I guess, in a small way when I'm working with my students here. Um, I, th I think students in the arts do have an advantage in that they, I think they probably leave uh, school with, I guess, maybe a higher sense of just personal awareness of who they are, because they're putting themselves out there over and over and over again with their, you know, work that they do. Yeah. So for our students, again, uh, courses outside of art that you took that you find applicable to what you do today and that you might recommend to, to students that, you know, sometimes we have those folks all across the university that say, I'm going to do X, and they really kind of start to pigeonhole themselves into that role or that job. But what were some things, you know, outside of your area that you found are really helpful today, both as an artist and in your profession as a teacher and as a manager? Gosh, okay, so there's so many things <laughs> that are valuable. And I can talk a little bit about some of the learning experiences that I had um, that have helped me grow as like an overall person. And, and some of them are specific to the university college classes I took and some are just other experiences that I had. Um, the first one that comes to mind is writing. I my English class that I took my first semester as a freshman at Bowling Green was an honors English class because I was in the honors program. And uh, boy, it, it knocked me down quite a few notches. I came from a small school. I thought I, you know, I had the good GPA. I thought I was doing pretty good. And I really learned a ton about being a more effective writer in that class and that was huge for me um, in multiple ways so i talk to my students now about the importance of writing and i in, you know incorporate it in in small ways but i incorporate it into all my classes because i think it's just so valuable no matter what area you go into um, so that uh, communication skills just public speaking being at ease talking with people is also gonna <laughs> be a benefit no matter what area you're in. A lot of that I think I learned being in 4-H when I was a kid, you know, you have to give up, stand up and give your demonstration on whatever it is. And there was a lot of public speaking that I had to do. So I think I learned some of those skills early on just because of that. It wasn't necessarily a class that I ever took in high school or in college. Um, so I guess those are my top two, probably the writing and the communication. They're just so broadly applicable. And then for students at Finley, if they're studying the arts, there's all kinds of things that could be helpful for them um, career wise, whether it's uh, taking, you know, getting a marketing minor, taking marketing, or we have students that are uh, also studying writing or English. We have students that are uh, in theater as well. There's so many different kind of areas at Finley that students can tap into that'll just kind of grow their skill set in, in a way that makes sense for them. Tell me a little bit about the process of what you do. Let, let's start with painting. Tell me about how you paint. <laughs> well, so 
I'll start with, it's been a little while since I've painted on a regular basis. I've been drawing more recently, but as far as painting goes, probably the toughest part of the process for me is finding the subject matter that I can uh, get involved with and subject matter that will sustain me through you know, multiple paintings. Uh, that's the toughest step for me in the art process. I enjoy art and I chose art because I like the craft of it and the making of it. So the ideation part is the tough part for me. For some people, that's the driving factor that need to express themselves in some way um, is what drives them. Or there are people who just have, you know, tons and tons of ideas floating around that are just like waiting to get out. I am not that person. <laughs> so that's the toughest part is find identifying, um, you know, useful subject matter. And then after that, once I've got that, um, then, then I'm in, I'm in good shape because engaging in the actual process to me is, is the fun part. So. I would say I'm probably just the opposite. I have no artistic talent, but I've got a lot of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and does, you know, to get into specifics, you said you've been drawing more recently and, and uh, I can attest, I own some of your drawings actually yeah. you know, on display in my house. Uh, walk us through that. So drawing, uh, same problem, right? At the beginning, finding the subject matter for that. But the drawing process, for me has been far more enjoyable recently um, for several reasons. One, it's a faster process so I can get farther along in a body of work in a shorter amount of time. Uh, so that's one reason I really like it. Another reason that I am enjoying the drawing so much is that drawings often don't seem as precious, right? Um, as maybe a painting would. Uh, and that goes back to what I said earlier about artists learning to like deal with failure um, and to persist with things and knowing that things aren't gonna be perfect every time. With, it's a, with a drawing, it's just a lot easier to sit down and say, okay, I'm probably gonna make a bad drawing. And you spend two or three hours and maybe it's good, in which case, great, but it could be bad <laughs> and that's okay. And you move on to the next one. So there's, um, it's like a lower risk, I guess, just personally, uh, to be working on drawings. Uh, so those are the reasons I've been, I'm, I'm enjoying it more, yeah. Tell me about a role model in your life, um, how they helped you with your professional and personal goals. Role models, okay, there's a lot that I could pick from for different reasons. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll stick I'll, uh, or stick with or start with art. So role models in terms of art, my elementary and high school art teacher was one of my biggest role models. And she's probably one of the reasons that I went into art education. Um, and so her name's Kay Otten and I had her in elementary school, I had her in high school and I learned so many skill sets from her uh, that, like it, I just felt very confident when I got out of high school that I had the skills that I needed to study art. And when I think about it, there's a lot of things that she taught me as a high school student that I teach my drawing one students here at the university. Uh, so she's impacted way more people than she realizes <laughs> with what she taught me. Um, so that's one. And then also in graduate school, my advisor that I had my painting advisor for grad school uh, was a big role model. It was, I, it's kind of funny when I think about it because when I looked at his teaching, I learned a lot by watching him teach and observing him teach. Um, but as a professor, he's a very philosophical, very uh, serious kind of person, very heady. Um, and when I was in graduate school, you know, I, I saw how successful he was in working with students and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if I could be that, you know, kind of professor. And then when I started teaching, I quickly realized that is not who I am. 
at all <laughs> as an educator. So that was that was off the board. But I appreciated how he worked with students and the way he challenged them and the skill sets that he taught them. So I learned a lot by observing him. And I also learned a lot just working with him on my own body of work. And probably the biggest thing that I take away from that is um, he would often talk about the importance of your work, having honesty and integrity to it um, and being honest to who you are and so that's probably one of the biggest things I took away from that experience that I try to share with my own students or emphasize with them that, you know, your work needs to be honest and it needs to have integrity to it. So, yeah. I think that's good advice. I, sometimes <laughs> I think at least as a teacher, what I've learned from others is sometimes the negative examples are as powerful as the positive ones. Because there are some folks that I think were absolutely brilliant in their field, but we're not very good at teaching. Mm -hmm. And you, you know those things, you see them and you see what not to do. I think of a lot of examples of that, <laughs> but it, I think that, yeah, that, those, those stick with you. You don't necessarily need to emulate what you see so much as, as learn from it, to your point. Yeah. What are you most proud of in, in your professional career? in my professional career gosh um it could be more than one thing several things totally right. divergent if you want right so overall i'm proudest of my teaching and working with students and gosh there's so many things that they do that you know bring or make me proud of them uh but I guess if I had to pinpoint just a couple of students, sort of their story, uh, a couple that I would point to, one would be Kelsey Rich, who is a student. She uh, studied art. She studied art management. When she graduated, she was out in the world for a few couple of years um, in, in living in Finley and sort of trying to navigate that. And then having that, oh no, what am I gonna do with an art degree experience? Um, and then she returned to UF to get her teaching certification. Now, I had known all along when she was an undergrad that she would be a brilliant teacher. And I think I tried to put that bug in her ear a few times. Um, so when she came back to pick up the certification, I was like, yes, okay, you, yep, you, this is what you need to be doing. And she's a fantastic teacher and she's, she's down in uh, Florida now teaching and she got teacher of the year last year. And I think it was maybe her second year teaching art at the high school. And, and probably the neatest part of the story is that one of her students at her school in Florida, uh, a student's name is Jasmine. Jasmine now is at UF. And so I got to have her this year as a freshman in class. So yeah, that's a pretty proud moment to see someone you've taught and then get to work with their students. Um, but yeah, that's a really, that's a really uh, neat experience. Yeah, and I'm thankful for it. <laughs> and the apprentice becomes the master, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what we all hope for. What's a mistake for our students that you could relay, uh, particularly, I think, as an undergraduate that you learn from, maybe something that was cathartic for you? Mistake. Okay, there's a lot of mistakes that get made during. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> right? There's lots of personal mistakes. There's academic mistakes. There's so many to choose from. Uh, I don't. Academically, I, I'm trying to pinpoint a couple things that I remember or that I've noted now as an adult. I think one of the things when I reflect back on my undergraduate classes is that I would often not take risks as an artist. I still am not a risk taker, but I at least can see it now <laughs> or try to navigate around that sometimes. I would often choose to do things that I knew I could do well, rather than maybe challenging myself to try expand my skill set or try things that I was less comfortable with. 
so that's one bit of advice that I would have to students is to, you know, get outside of your comfort zone sometimes and, and take some risks because those are the those are the moments when you're probably learning the most. Um, so that's one thing. And then uh, another thing is that how would I qualify this? I guess I would say like you just have to show up <laughs> to to class to life, uh, to work, to, to everything. Like that's step one, you need to get yourself there. Um, and everything else can get figured out and will fall into place one way or the other. And, and I, when did I learn this? I, I was in a, a figure drawing class and I had stayed up all night, I think, trying to get some drawings done for a midterm. And I, I went to class early the following day and I saw my instructor who happened to be a grad student, actually. I saw my instructor and I think I said, uh, you know, I don't think I'm gonna be able to make it to class later today. I, I stayed up all night, I'm really tired. I don't think I'm gonna be here. And he just looked at me and was like, and said, you know, like, that's not an excuse. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Okay, no, nope, doesn't matter if you're uh, a little bit tired. You 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 work through it, and it was it was just kind of funny thinking back that he just called me out and said nope, and and I showed up to class and it was all fine and good and yeah. So yeah, those are a couple things I can think of. <laughs> Great, thank you. We know obviously technology has affected art in many ways, just from materials to you know, the ubiquitous computer, for example, with graphic design and whatnot. Where do you see things going in the next 10 to 20 years in the field, broadly speaking, in, in the arts? Oh, gosh, I'm not even sure if I can answer this, because I am so not technologically oriented. <laughs> I'm like, give me the physical materials to do the things. Um, so that one's really kind of hard for me to answer. Um, okay. Gosh, let me hold on. Let me let me let me think though. I I can say that in class what I've been seeing recently, especially this just this past semester, is students using uh, technology a lot in the I guess ideation phase of creating something. I had Quite a few students in printmaking class who would do a lot of their preliminary drawings and planning and design work on their tablets or on their computers and it made that ideation process so much more flexible and efficient um, as opposed to drawing it erasing it redrawing it erasing it trying you know it just made the whole process a lot faster um, and it seemed tremendously beneficial and uh for them so that's one piece that i've seen lately that i i really like um as far as things moving forward technologically i guess i'm in some ways i'm always a little leery about how much technology becomes involved in things because i certainly appreciate it when it makes our jobs maybe easier or more efficient but there's something to be said for having to do things by hand um, and understanding the nuance of having to do something by hand wow. that you just don't always get um, when you're working on something digitally, I guess. Um, yeah, and, and it's harder to do things by hand. And I think it it's beneficial to kind of go through that process of having to struggle through it before you can really, really truly appreciate the ease or efficiency of being able to do it more quickly. Yeah. I see that um, in technology a lot. So I used to create web pages back web 1.0 before you had the, you know, kind of what you see is what you get. WYSIWYG is the expression. Um, programs that just created web pages for you. And now we've moved so far beyond that. But as a creator, as a web creator back in the 90s, you have to know how to code. If you didn't know the code, you couldn't do it. So it was a really kind of immediate 
relationship to what you were doing. You had to understand how to create, let's say, a certain color of green on the screen. And now the program does that for you. And I think about this kind of on a meta level as, as creators, because everybody, everybody is a, as they say today, a content producer, right? Every kid in the world is using TikTok or YouTube or something like that to create um, an individual expression of themselves. I see it with my daughters. But it's so easy to do that, right? There's, there's layers missed from it, I think. You, you talk about your direct relationship to what you do, the materials. When you sketch, it is the paper and it's a pencil or a crayon or chalk or whatever, right? And now in the computer world, there's so many layers. There's the layer of the program, there's the layer of the code, there's the layer of the binary. So it becomes like this, this kind of distant expression where so much of that creative process is already done for you in a template. So it kind of forces you to choose certain things that you might not choose if you had all possibilities available to you or you knew how to do the layers of code, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, things are, I'm trying to think a way to talk about it, like in a bigger way. It's like so much visual imagery is being created on a very fast and superficial level that my fear is that we, we we're going to lose the depth of yeah the depth there's something that happens when you have to struggle through a longer process to get to something and it has to do with like visually how it looks the quality of it the materials you use but also just the content and the ideas that are being conveyed uh i think there's things that are lost when you don't have that depth of experience and i think it also uh in some ways for people who are used to using technology to create it um maybe in some ways limits uh the ability to to concentrate on something for long periods of time the way you would have to do have to if when you're working on it i think by hand like things can be done so fast uh, and that's something that i guess i've seen change with students um, their ability to to focus on the art making process for hours and hours at a time um, it, it keeps getting shorter so i'm i'm a little concerned but i'm thankful that the arts require that of students and require that of people that that attention span and that long focus uh, because there's things again that happen in there that just don't happen when you get to zip through things <laughs> yeah let's change directions just a bit here and i ask this question of almost everybody i interview and i think about what you do as a process is is it's hard to probably establish boundaries okay this is my personal and, and you know my things i do for pleasure versus work because it's all kind of mixed together but in that in that line of thinking, do you have hobbies and interests outside of art? What are some things that you do that maybe influence your art that you do for fun? Uh, yeah, so I do have hobbies and interests outside of art. Uh, I'm not sure how much they, well, yeah, they do, I suppose, impact it, but uh, things that I do, I work in my yard in the summer. Uh, it's one of the things I really enjoy doing. And again, it goes back to just that physical interaction with materials, okay? At this point, it's weeds and plants and soil, but uh, I enjoy just the process of working with materials. So I enjoy, you know, gardening and being out in the yard. I still sew a lot. I mean, I learned that when I was little and I enjoyed doing it, that uh, bookmaking, I mean, just, kind of craft sort of things that I enjoy that relate to the process of making. Um, I'm learning to be a baker, kind of. I enjoy baking. <laughs> but again, I, I, it's it's that process, that, those kind of things that I enjoy. Okay. You're walking down a hall on campus and you turn down this hall and there's a couple students down in the hall and they're saying, they're talking about you. And they're saying nice things. What are they saying? 
Gosh. Okay. That's good. I'm glad they're saying nice things. Um, oh, wait. <laughs> no. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, hopefully, and, and, and no, and I know that students do, do say these things because I see it in evaluations and things. Uh, being helpful to them I, as they try to work through a process, I think is, is really probably one of the most important things I can do. A lot of students that I have are not art majors. And so if I am able to be helpful and to talk them through a process of art making that they're not familiar with, then I feel like I'm doing a good job at my job. <laughs> and so that and, and, and also hopefully like a, a sense of humor just about life or not um, that I convey to them a sense of not being stressed out about life. I think those are important things to share or model, share with my students or model for them that, you know, yeah, life is crazy sometimes, it's tough, but if we can just uh, stay as relaxed as possible, take things as they come, laugh as much as possible, uh, that will uh, just make uh, classes and life in general maybe a little bit more easy a little easier to deal with. So I guess, yeah. So those are the things I would hope they would be saying. <laughs> well, since you kind of hinted at this, you keep going down that hall and you make a left turn down another hall and there's some more students and they're not saying such nice things. What are they saying? Gosh, okay. They're saying that, uh, <laughs> they say it every semester, <laughs> grading criteria are not clearly communicated. <laughs> <laughs> it's art. <laughs> it's art. Oh, so it's hard to uh, convey to students how art is evaluated. It's just hard to evaluate art to start with to a certain extent. It certainly can be, but it's about an entire process. It's not just necessarily about a product. Um, so that's probably one of the toughest things for some students to understand because it's not right and wrong. Um, and there aren't clear answers to things and that carries over into evaluation. Um, it, it's sort of along those lines. I think it's sometimes maybe students would say it's, you know, maybe things aren't clear enough or things are just as far as projects go. Uh, I try to be as clear as possible. But there's a certain level of ambiguity that comes along with art projects and the art process and that it's sometimes hard for students to sort of be okay with not having a really clear set of rules to follow. <laughs> so that's sometimes a little bit, a little bit harder. I'm trying to think what else. I don't know. They didn't find me in my office when I was supposed to be. I run around when I shouldn't be. <laughs> How dare you not be in your office when they need you? I don't know. At that yeah. very moment. <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, I'm a student. I'm thinking of studying in your program. I'm one of these prospective students at these new student res registrations, or as we call them, uh, NSRs. Mm. Um, you got 30 minutes. You got that 30, 30, excuse me, 30 second elevator speech. What do you say? Give it to me. My unprepared elevator speech. Uh, so my, it really goes back to, I think a lot of the things we've already talked about. There's skills that like, yes, come be an art major. There's skills that you're gonna get here that you may not get in other fields of study, whether it's that ability to be creative and envision possibilities or if it's that ability to be persistent and to persevere, or if it's that ability to be someone who observes life at a deeper level through this creative process. Um, those are just super valuable skills to have no matter you know, what, what you end up doing for a job. Uh, those are really important. And I think another thing 
as far as a student deciding to major in art or design or art education, it's a field where you can just keep learning and growing forever. Like it's just part of the process. You just keep developing as an, as an artist throughout your whole life. Um, it, it's it's a, a field of study that you can keep doing into well into old age. There aren't necessarily a lot of physical restrictions on it. Um, so that's one of the amazing things about being an artist. You can just keep keep creating and keep growing and keep learning about yourself as a person your entire life as you pursue that career. Often in, in studying the history of some famous artists, I would notice uh, with many of them, they live very long lives. And I gotta think that there's something about that creative process that gives you the energy and inspiration and, and health to keep going. I can't say the same about many famous writers. <laughs> they often die younger, so I'm not sure. Maybe I should switch to becoming an artist. Yeah, the, there's a, uh, I think the exhibit closed up already, but there's a Wayne Tebow exhibit that was at the Toledo Museum of Art. And I think it's a traveling exhibit, but it was celebrating um, Wayne's birthday this year. He's a hundred, all right? So a hundred pieces to celebrate his birthday. And I went to the show and there were paintings in the in the show that were maybe created, I don't know, three or four years ago. So, you know, kudos to him. He's still uh, right. painting and, and sticking with it. And I've seen retrospectives of, oh, it was, it was de Kooning. I saw a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art several years ago and it had work from when he was 12 years old to when he was you know in his 80s that he was doing up until he passed away and when I I was not a de Kooning fan when I went into that exhibit that retrospective but after I had walked through the entire top floor of MoMA and seen his life journey I guess in this exhibit I was practically crying by the time I got to the wow. end I was like wow I, ha I, I get you now after I got to see your entire life's work. So, so I got off track a little bit there, but I think it's a good example of the fact that, you know, you just keep growing and you can keep growing. That's something I've always appreciated about, you know, art with the A, the capital A, right? And you think about somebody like uh, a Picasso or even a Jackson Pollock, you, you admire the ideas sometimes right? As opposed to the technical aspects, when you look at somebody like da Vinci or Rembrandt as kind of a comparison, um, that you can hold those two seemingly separate ideas, yet there's a synergy among them, and appreciate both in their own right. You know, I, uh, Picasso comes to mind, and just somebody who kept changing his style and his approach over his career. Didn't he live to be in his 90s? Yeah, he and, did. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's just amazing to me, whether or not I appreciate the work itself, I appreciate, I appreciate the prodigiousness, the constant ability to evolve. Um, and as you said earlier, to take chances, to, to be risky. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me. So I'm gonna circle back with a question. You mentioned, you know, obviously your parents were both teachers. They were high school teachers. You started off that way. So why'd you make the jump to college? Right, so I taught high school art for six years and then I decided to go back to graduate school to get my MFA. I honestly I did not go back with the intention that I was going to move into higher education. I just wanted a couple years of me time to work on my artwork and so Finley High School very graciously gave me I guess basically a leave of absence. I was I had the option to go back um, after I finished grad school and, and returned to teaching at Finley High School. And my, I'd gotten married in the meantime and my husband and I just decided, no, let's move to Columbus. So we were still young enough that we were like, ah, we don't have jobs, it's fine. We'll figure something out when we get there. So we moved to Columbus and then I started teaching part-time there at Ohio State and then uh, a position opened up at Finley kind of unexpectedly one summer and I got a call from Ed Coral, 
who's our ceramics professor. And he said, you know, would you be interested in applying? And I said, well, sure, of course, right? So uh, in, in some ways it just kind of worked out. Uh, maybe it's bad to admit this, but career-wise life has just sort of always provided for me in a sense. I, again, I hate to admit it. I don't know that I've ever had the big, huge goals. You know, I want to be this person or do this within five years or 10 years. Uh, you know, career-wise, life has just sort of kept presenting the next step in, you know, placing it in front of me. And I took it, I guess. So I, 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 it's kind of odd, and I feel like I've been very fortunate in that way. It sounds almost karmic in some sense, you know, good things happen to good people, right? <laughs> I, I'll go with that. I, yeah? Yeah. I was, I was telling somebody, it was funny this, this morning, this, this is very, you know, um, deja vu in a way, because I was having a conversation on a walk with a colleague this morning, and um, we were joking about the, the vaccination lottery that's going on in Ohio right now. This will probably mean nothing if somebody watches this in a year, but um, the $5 million offerings, if you've been vaccinated, you go to Ohio Lottery, you register, and if you can prove you're vaccinated, you're eligible to win a million dollars. So we were kind of talking about that. And this person who shall go unnamed, a colleague here, was saying, you know what, I kind of feel like I've already won the lottery in many ways. And, and I often say that too, you know, I, I, I married well, I have beautiful children, I'm comfortable. I enjoy what I'm doing. I love working with colleagues like you. Uh, it's been a good life. But I always remember this line, and I don't remember where it came from, to your point. It just says, what do you do when your reality exceeds your dreams? You keep it to yourself. <laughs> because there are a lot of people out there that aren't quite as happy and are still kind of searching for themselves in that. And, you know, I think that's a good way to kind of dovetail on the end of this is that that's the great thing I think about being an artist at any level. It allows you to keep exploring who you are. Mm -hmm. It never ends. Yeah. So, okay. all right. Well, thank you very much, Val, for your time. I, I appreciate you joining us on this episode of Ask the Professor. Um, on a personal note, I, I'll also mention as chair of the department, um, maybe not so fun duties in your life, but um, I, I have to share this with the group. I think you're fantastic at what you do. Uh, those of you that know anything about the disparate program that is our visual and performing arts department here at UF, it's a lot of different tentacles. And Val does an exceptional job of managing all the aspects from music to theater, to art history, to her own areas. Um, and, and I can't thank you enough for the great job you do. And I don't know if you knew you had that skill set in you, but you're a fantastic chair and the department benefits from your service. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, that's a whole nother learning process that that could be a whole nother discussion. <laughs> uh, yeah, but thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. And, and I do feel fortunate that I, I do I think have the skills to be able to do that. And uh, another one of those things that life just presented. <laughs> it's the karma, you just keep walking and the grass keeps getting greener. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so if you like what you watch today, check us out at UFTV. The easiest way to do that is, is actually just go to UFTV. It's pretty easy or Finley, UFTV, either of those in any search engine will, will populate our page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's the easiest way to, to get a hold of these videos if you like what you see and ask the professor. And if you'd like to follow up with Professor Escobedo, you can reach her at, is it escobedo at finley.edu? Yes. That's pretty easy. Again, uh, if you want to spell that out for our group. Sure. It's E-S-C-O-B-E-D-O -E at finley.edu. Okay. And on that note, thank you again, Val. And thank you all for watching Ask the Professor. I hope you'll join us on future episodes. Be well. <laughs>